Thank you, Amos. Hello, everybody. Um, Almost that was a lovely tribute to, to Mike and, and, and so I won't uh, say too much more other than to say that I can't believe the firefighter problem has come back into our workshop. I, I think so many of us remember the spirited debate that ensued when that firefighter problem first uh, was introduced and, and so much so that I think that we actually had to declare a moratorium on discussions in subsequent meetings uh, because it kind of took over our, our debate. So it was lovely to, um, to, to, to be reminded of, of, of that uh, happier uh, time and that happier moment. Um, I'm just, I just want to say that, you know, as almost mentioned, Mike was a constant in the activities of our institute. And, and just for me personally, having him as a co-chair on the advisory board made decision making, making easier. And, and it was just a comfort to know we were pursuing a shared vision. And so, so I too will miss him greatly. Uh, and, and there's a, a large hole there that I'm not sure how we're going to fill. Um, moving on to the first session, and I don't, I haven't seen whether Carl is here, but I assume Carl is, uh, is, is here somewhere, and, and I can't tell from the Zoom, but, but let's assume that Carl is here. Our first speaker I'm delighted to introduce uh, is for our invited session is Carl Friston. Um, he's a theoretical neuroscientist and an authority on brain imaging. He invented statistical parametric mapping, voxel-based uh, voxel um, morph morphometry, and dynamic causal modeling. Uh, these contributions were motivated by schizophrenia research and theoretical studies of value learning formulated as the disconnection hypothesis of schizophrenia. His mathematical contributions include variational Laplacian procedures and generalized filtering for hierarchical Bayesian model inversion. He currently works on models on, on of functional integration in the human brain and the principles that underlie uh, neuronal interactions. His main contributions to theoretical neurobiology is a free energy principle for action and perception uh, known as active inference. His awards are way too numerous to list here, um, but, but one thing I will note, I asked him whether there was anything he wanted me to add, and he said I was free to do that, and, and some of you know how dangerous that can be, but I, I will add that, um, that I noticed that he's got, and, and this is as an economist, this is just massive. He's got over 144 Google Scholar site, 144,000 Google Scholar citations. Uh, so, so uh, with with without further ado, and uh, and and it gives me great pleasure to introduce Carl Friston. Carl, take it away. Thank you very much. That was one in, indeed one of my favourite facts about me that you that you picked up. Um, let me just get myself organised and then. Well, again, thank you for that lovely introduction, and it's a great pleasure and honour to, to be invited to speak to you, particularly on, on this sort of uh, sad occasion. I'm intrigued by the firefighter problem. That's, that's, that sounds something I'd like to discuss, even if you're not allowed to discuss it. I'm not sure I'm going to get to that depth um, of problem or um, challenge. Um, my, um, my hope was in the next 30, 35 minutes um, was to introduce a perspective on um, evidence accumulation, um, the handling of information from the point of view of normative models of sentient creatures, uh, uh, creatures like us or indeed um, viruses and plants. And I'm going to take my lead um, from a simple assumption that every self-organizing system, every information processing system is at the end of the day thinking and behaving in a way to maximize the evidence for its models of the world. Uh, and I'm going to try and motivate that from a sort of um, machine learning perspective, um, practically, um, and as the talk goes on, um, show how these ideas translate in terms of the sentient behavior of um, biotic systems like, uh, like animals, and, in, including ourselves. Um, as has been mentioned, this comes under the rubric in the life sciences of um, as active inference, active sensing, uh, sensing in the spirit of trying to disclose those data or that sensory information, which resolves the greatest amount of uncertainty about your model or hypothesis about how those data were caused. Now, if we have time, I'll give you a brief simulation of the sort of epistemic foraging that ensues from, from this. So self-evidencing is very simple. It's, all it's saying is that you can account for most perspectives on behavior um, 
in terms of this single underlying imperative, which is that your internal states of the processing system, say internal brain states, and the way that you act upon the world and things that you can control on the outside are both there in order to maximize the probability of some observables or outcomes given or conditioned upon me or a model of how those outcomes were generated. Um, and I'm just motivating um, the simplicity of this assumption uh, from the perspective of a number of global approaches to uh, behavior and self-organization in the life and sometimes the physical sciences. So if these outcomes are the most likely kind of outcomes that I would expect to encounter, then the, they define operationally my characteristic outcomes to which I will aspire and apparently work towards. So in economics, you could think of the log of the probability of an outcome given it is experienced or witnessed by a particular model or me um, as standing in for a value or a utility. And from that, one can spin off reinforcement learning, optimal control theory, and indeed in economics, uh, expected uh, utility theory. Uh, that's interesting because the negative quantity of this way of reading value is self-information, surprise, or more simply uh, surprise. And that means that this imperative here, the self-evidencing, simply translates as the imperative to maximize the mutual information for example, the Infomax principle in uh, neuroscience or the principles of minimum redundancy, maximum efficiency from Horace Barlow, and indeed the free energy principle, um, which we have been involved with, where this free energy serves as a bound on this quantity, uh, the self-information here. That itself in turn is interesting because the time average of self-information is entropy, which means that this imperative, the self-evidencing um, is can also be read as the holy grail of self-organization, mainly to minimize the dispersion or the, um, the uh, entropy or the dissipation of my observable states uh, that you find in um, theories of self-organization ranging from cybernetics to sy synergetics. And of course, if you're a physiologist, this is just a statement of homeostasis, keeping uh, physiological states within viable bounds. But I'm gonna take, um, another perspective on this quantity and treat this quantity as the probability of some data given a generative model, where in Bayesian statistics that would be called the, um, the Bayesian model evidence or more generally the marginal likelihood, marginal, marginalizing over all the parameters that um, engendered or generated those data there. And in my world that um, leads to things like the Bayesian brain hypothesis, formulations of evidence accumulation, um, predictive coding in engineering, and now indeed um, in, the, in the neurosciences. So I'm just going to now unpack that kind of self-evidencing in a slightly more technical way with a special evidence, uh, emphasis on um, this variational free energy that serves in machine learning as a bound on the log evidence in the sense that um, we can create a variational bound simply by equipping the log evidence with a quantity that can never be less than zero, namely a, a KL divergence. And in this instance, it's a KL divergence between the some approximate or Bayesian beliefs about states of the world generating the data and the true posterior uh, over those states if I were able, um, uh, given those data. So by um, optimizing or extremizing this free energy, um, we have on the one hand a convergence of our beliefs encoded by our internal states uh, to the true posterior, whilst at the, uh, on the other hand, um, this bound now becomes a bound approximation to the log evidence that this um, self-evidencing principle um, uh, aspires to, uh, to maximize. Um, and just to motivate why this might be a useful perspective, and what you get from this is essentially um, explainable artificial intelligence in the sense that having a generative model there commits you to writing down a way in which your data were generated that you can explain to somebody else. Um, it also um, requires you to make explicit and transparent your prior assumptions that are entailed by the form and the structure of that generative model uh, and any hyperparameters um, associated with it. 
Um, in a sense, it also um, gives you a design um, optimality um, in terms of um, making optimal decisions of an abductive sort in terms of um, uh, using this model in order to um, make inferences about the causes or the way that your data uh, were generated. Um, and that itself, we will see, leads to a principled way for data mining or data foraging, uh, and indeed epistemics and um, um, generalized or artificial general intelligence, particularly with sparse data, and we'll, we'll come to that. But there is another perspective, though, uh, or another way of carving up this um, variational free energy functional. Um, and so just by rearranging the terms, I can also read it um, as a mixture of accuracy and complexity. So essentially, the free energy is accuracy minus the complexity, where the complexity here uh, scores the difference between um, my Bayesian beliefs after seeing some data and my prior beliefs. So literally the degrees of freedom or the amount to which I have changed my mind uh, in the face of some data. Um, and that complexity term plays an important role um, in many guises. It's just an expression of Occam's principle. In the brain, it leads to things like factorizations and functional specializations, a simpler way of explaining or making sense of data uh, with minimum redundancy and maximum efficiency. If you're an engineer, it also implies that you're aspiring to provide an accurate account of observable data um, with the minimum computational cost, uh, leading to notions of bounded rationality, literally uh, based upon an evidence bound, uh, uh, known in uh, my world as approximate Bayesian inference, that rests upon priors that sometimes people refer to as heuristics. Um, and of course, one can appeal now to the physics of uh, information via the Jasinski equality and Landauer's principle, which means that minimizing computational cost also implies a thermodynamic efficiency, that in principle, the best way of accounting for data or making sense of data should be that way that uses up the least energy and is um, um, performed in the minimum amount of time. So the basic story I want to tell in this short presentation um, uh, rests upon thinking about, well, that's fine for understanding sentient behavior and a principle for sort of um, um, uh, optimal action in the moment. What would it mean if I considered devices, artifacts or creatures that can plan into the future and have a generative model of the consequences of their action? Um, and what would this self-evidence imperative mean for plans and the kinds of behavior we'd expect to see under that imperative? And the, the answer is, is um, or one answer at least, is, is very simple. Um, it, you know, because now I am um, trying to maximize or optimize a free energy bound on evidence, but in the absence of actual outcomes, the outcomes become a random variable, and I can simply take the expectation of this evidence bound um, under the predictive distribution of the outcomes that would ensue if I did that. And if we follow that through, what we're going to see is that basically um, we can explain um, the best kinds of plans, the self-evidencing plans, um, as fulfilling two imperatives, one that of Bayesian optimal, uh, Bayes optimal design, experimental design in terms of maximizing expected accuracy, whilst making Bayes optimal decisions by minimizing risk, by minimizing the expected complexity. And I'm going to basically um, uh, rehearse the uh, observation or suggestion that minimizing expected, uh, sorry, maximizing expected free energy is basically a mixture of these two things. Um, uh, just to make this a bit more heuristic, what, what I would normally do to a, um, uh, uh, your psychology audience is ask them to imagine that they are an owl and that um, you're hungry. And then I'd normally ask a member of the audience, what are you going to do? Uh, I won't do that now, but um, um, uh, I'm, I'm hoping that you're all thinking, well, I'm going to go and look for food. And indeed, uh, that is the um, absolutely the correct answer. Um, but in answering like that, what you have said is something quite fundamental. Um, and I'm going to try and unpack how important that answer is just by comparing and contrasting 
two ways of writing down normative or objective functions for good behavior. Um, and I'm actually going to repair these two perspectives um, 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 in, you know, in a few slides, but I'm going to deliberately sort of introduce and, and celebrate this, this distinction or this dialectic. First of all, I could assume that if I make a move on the world, I implement a particular action, you, then there are going to be certain states of the world that ensue. And I may have a value function over those states. And if I had a value function of states, then there exists a policy that is defined in terms of the best action to take from any given state, namely that which maximizes the value of the ensuing state. However, there is another way of formulating good behavior, um, which speaks to the answer, I'm going to look for food. Because looking and searching can be construed as a way of minimizing uncertainty, in this instance where the prey is, um, and uncertainty is an attribute of a, um, a probability distribution. I'm going to refer to that as a, a Bayesian belief or a conditional probability distribution. So that tells us something really important. It says that the best behaviors, the best actions, the best plans are, cannot be functions of states of the world. They have to be functionals of beliefs about states of the world. And that answer, looking for food, also tells you something else because it matters whether I look for my prey and then I eat it, or whether I try to eat it and then look for my prey. So that uh, introduces a notion of sequential policies or sequential actions that have to be optimized in relation uh, to this functional of, um, of uh, beliefs about states of the world. Um, and I'm gonna frame that, that aspect of, of optimizing a trajectory or a sequence of plans in terms of a principle of least action, where action here is just the path or the time integral of a, um, a functional belief. And, and indeed, it's going to be the expected free energy. Um, and hence, the, the path or the time integral of the free energy is an action. So what we have at hand here are two very different ways of thinking about sort of a good way to exchange with our world. On the one hand, you've got Bellman's optimality principle that rests upon a value function of states. And um, uh, many of you will be familiar with that in terms of optimal control theory, dynamic programming, deep reinforcement learning, Bayesian decision theory, and so on. But there is another way of thinking about it. Um, and that's possibly um, slightly simpler, uh, appeals to Hamilton's principle of stationary action, or at least action. And that's really um, the principle um, that the free energy principle inherits from, um, we'll also see that this um, is very closely aligned with notions of artificial curiosity and intrinsic motivation in robotics. Um, the principles behind acquiring the right kind of data, optimal Bayesian design and sequential policy optimization. So um, I'm just gonna take you through the functional form of, of this objective function one more time, because I think um, you know, its simplicity um, is compelling and it speaks exactly to a variational or a, 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 an appeal to Hamilton's principle of least action as possibly another way of thinking about um, behavior or at least sentient behavior. So this is the, the basic setup that we use to understand and simulate and indeed model um, um, behavior and choices that are informed by observations. We, um, we have some observations that come in uh, they are used to optimize our Bayesian beliefs about hidden states of the world behind the observations, generating those observations. And we do that by finding the most accurate account that's as simple as possible of those data. Um, and then we take those beliefs about hidden states or latent states of the world, and then we use them to evaluate the expected free energy given a particular policy. Um, and in so doing, we are effectively taking the expected complexity and the expected accuracy conditioned upon a way of moving forward. Um, and that equips every way of moving forward, every policy with a score and expected free energy that can be um, associated with a log probability of, of me doing that. And then I can just apply a softmax operator, find the most likely plan, select my next action, change the outside world that would generate new data and so the cycle continues. 
So that's the basic idea. Um, is exactly the same equations that I've unpacked um, um, as previously, just to um, reiterate that we can either regard this free energy functional, this evidence bound, uh, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> as a mixture of complexity and accuracy, or we can just rearrange it to express it as a bound on log evidence, as you would do, say, in um, machine learning or deep learning with things like uh, variational autoencoders. Um, and the reason I've done it like that is just to see what happens to these terms when we take the expectation to form the expected free energy. And what happens is that the complexity becomes a risk, the inaccuracy becomes ambiguity, the evidence bound becomes something uh, known in um, uh, economics and um, robotics as intrinsic value or motivation, and the log evidence becomes an extrinsic value that we'll see in a moment can be associated with things like expected utility. So what licenses my interpretation of these expected terms? Well, um, let me just go through and unpack this expected free energy um, by looking at a number of different special cases. Let's pretend that my prior beliefs about outcomes, given I am me, encode my preferences, my prior preferences about the sort of outcomes I expect to encounter following all actions. And let's assume I'm agnostic about what happens. I have no particular preferences for this or that outcome. That just leaves this quantity here, which is the expected evidence bound. And this quantity is just the mutual information or expected mutual information between the causes and the consequences under a particular plan of soliciting those uh, outcomes there. Um, in neurobiology, in particular in um, the visual search um, literature, where you, people try to work out where am I going to look next? You know, what motivates that visual palpation of the world? Um, uh, the motivation is just the intrinsic value of resolving uncertainty uh, called Bayesian surprise. Uh, more, more, I think, revealingly, it's just the degree of belief updating or information gain um, afforded some outcomes. In other words, the difference, or well, the KL divergence, between my Bayesian beliefs about hidden states, if I were able to see the outcomes that ensued following a policy compared to my beliefs before looking at those outcomes. Again, speaking to the difference between a posterior and a prior, but now in the future. So it's an expected um, divergence or belief updating or information gain. Uh, that is intrinsically valuable, irrespective of what you think or will uh, prefer to happen. Let me now take another um, source of uncertainty off the table, um, namely the ambiguity. I'm going to make a simplifying assumption that I can see all the hidden states of the world, that, that my sensations, my sensory observables, are a direct mapping of the states of the world that generated them. And in this instance, um, the S's become the O's, um, and we're only left, this ambiguity term disappears, and we're just left with this quantity here, which is another uh, KL divergence or relative entropy here, uh, namely the difference between my anticipated outcomes or states given a particular policy and my preferred outcomes, my prior preferences. So all we're saying here is that the Actions that have the optimal expected free energy are just those, in the absence of any ambiguity, that minimize risk, They're as scored by the difference between what I anticipate will happen and what a priori um, I prefer to happen. And if I make a final move, which is to take the last kind of uncertainty um, out of the game, namely the uncertainty um, that depends about states of the world that depends upon my action, that I'm just left with this term here, the extrinsic value, um, that if you remember, we're associating with utility in economics or um, negative loss functions in optimal control theory, uh, which just means that we're trying to um, optimize the expected log probability of our preferred outcomes or expected value here. So what we have at hand is um, a decomposition that applies to policies when scored in terms of an expected free energy functional um, that can be unpacked or carved into an expected value that underwrites phase optimal decisions 
Um, but importantly, this epistemic turn, this information gain um, that is formally identical to the principles that underlie Bayes' optimal design and um, things like active learning with, with unknown parameters. So in short, the expected value plus the information gain is literally equal to uh, the expected free energy. I, I slipped this slide in because I thought some of you might like to think of it in terms of information diagrams. Um, but given the time constraints um, and the opportunity for discussion, I'm not going to go into that. It's just an interesting game that you can play in terms of thinking about uh, an information theoretic partition in terms of inf um, Bayesian design, information bottlenecks, empowerment, and other takes on uh, the right kinds of information gathering um, um, behavior. Um, I want to whip through now a simulation because um, um, you know, you know, we want to leave as much time for, for any discussion um, that sort of um, exemplifies how these mechanics would unfold um, in uh, empirical behavior um, in my world. Um, um, here, looking at sort of um, small animals or rats making decisions. What we normally do is, is build a generator model based upon a Markov decision process of discrete states uh, that generate outcomes parameterized by a likelihood mapping A. And then we make the transitions over time among the hidden states depend upon some policy, uh, depending upon probability transition matrices, where the policy itself um, rests upon my prior preferences or some cost function. And then I can equip this model with a few um, initial priors and hyperparameters. And I've now got a, completely, a fairly complete description of any kind of behavior that can be written down in terms of discrete updates of hidden or latent states that generate observables. I can then apply standard variational um, techniques to um, optimize my variational and expected uh, free energies, uh, essentially using off the sh shelf uh, technology um, um, that rests upon defining this approximate posterior. Um, just from, really for my interest, um, when one takes these off the shelf belief updating, basing belief updating, variational message passing, or belief propagation schemes, they look remarkably similar to the way that neuroscientists understand message passing and belief updating in the, in the brain in terms of perception as updating beliefs about um, expected states of the world, policy selection, uh, usually as, associated with the striatum or um, integration between parts of the surface of the brain and the striatum uh, that rests upon this expected free energy. And indeed, some hyper prize here, or hyper uh, uh, precision parameters reflecting the confidence or the uncertainty that I afford my beliefs about what I'm going to do next. We can do learning, and then we just select the action on the basis of these updated um, expectations about policies. So when we do that, and I'll just close with an example of uh, a synthetic rat doing this. Um, um, so this uh, little paradigm here involves a rat in a tea maze. It can go and secure a reward that's either on the right or the left of the two upper arms. It can only make two moves, um, uh, uh, but it's got the opportunity to go to the lower arm and get an instructional cue that tells it that the cue, is, the, the reward is um, on the left or on the right hand side. So it's got a choice. It can either take a gamble and go to the, uh, one of the two upper arms and be right or wrong, and it has to stay there. So these are absorbing states when it, when it gets to the baited areas. Or it can waste one of its moves by finding out exactly where the reward is and then go and secure its reward with um, a high degree of uncertainty. So from the point of view of expected utility, these are fairly balanced options. But clearly from the point of view of um, this um, self-evidencing in the future, um, the information gain, the intrinsic value of going to resolve your uncertainty or this rat's uncertainty about the states of affairs um, is going to be more attractive and that's going to um, compel the rat to be exploratory um, and go and look at the queue, get that and then go and get its reward. Um, and um, indeed, that is what it does. So I'm just summarizing the behavior that in, uh, follows from integrating those um, belief propagation or variational message passing uh, schemes under this generative model, but with a twist. After the first couple of trials, we leave the reward here. 
so that in principle the rat is going to start to learn that the reward is all always here and indeed it does that um, and of course as it becomes more and more confident that the reward is here the intrinsic value the epistemic value the information gain afforded by going down here gets smaller and smaller and smaller and wanes and once it passes a threshold where the expected utility of going straight to the reward and staying there for an extra move um, supervenes, then its behavior switches deterministically and it switches from an exploration to an exploitation mode. And that's exactly what happens in this example um, after about the 20th, um, 20th uh, trial here. And all this depends upon accumulating knowledge about the contingencies, namely the context where on which side is the reward most likely to be over successive exposures that then couples back into this um, um, online active inference, planning as inference, uh, underwritten by this expected free energy. Uh, this is the last slide. I'm putting in this in just um, um, uh, to um, remind myself that there's an outstanding challenge here. I've sort of um, sold this self-evidencing as a um, uh, something that has construct validity in, in relation to lots of other ways of describing good behavior. Um, there may be a deeper backstory to this that relates to statistical physics and things like the integral fluctuation theorem, but to connect or complete that story, um, it requires one small move, um, which I'm happy to talk about, um, um, but not happy to waste any more time um, unpacking for you at the moment. So I'll, I'll give the last word to Einstein that uh, everything should be made as simple as possible, but not simpler. So it just remains me for me to thank those people whose ideas I've been talking about. And of course, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much indeed. Terrific, Carl. Thank you. Thank you so much for that uh, really an engaging talk and, and a, great, a great way to start off our, uh, our workshop. Um, I, I realized I actually forgot to, to mention to, to everybody else who's here that um, that what the format was going to be. So, so um, we did actually uh, plan for some ample time for 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 questions and for discussion. I think, as we know, as as people who have been to our workshops before know, that's one of the hallmarks of our workshops is uh, quite animated discussion. Uh, and so, thank you, Carl, also for leaving ample time for that. So, I want to um, open the floor up to discussions and questions. Maybe if you want to just drop a note into the chat to me, just to tell me of a question, so that we can. Uh, uh, Organize or line up the questions, but I think the first uh, question I know almost has uh, a few questions, so so we'll go to almost first. But uh, just drop me a note, as I said, if if you have questions uh, to ask. Thank you, Carl. First, it's it's uh, nice to see you again. Uh, uh, I I really enjoyed your talk and and the idea that you were able in in such a simple way to put decision theory within information theoretic framework in quantities, mostly the KL divergence, seem to be very interesting, very nice. I, myself, even though I work on this area for many years, I never really saw it in, in, in this way. So, so thank you for this. I have a, a simple question, though it could be outside the scope here. In, in a, a previous time I've seen you, uh, you were talking about Marco Blanket. And as, as you were passing through in one of the slides, I saw that you put your framework within a Markov blanket. Maybe I missed it, and it may be outside what you wanted to talk today, but if it's not, I would be happy to hear a little bit more how this fits within your theory of, of, of uh, uh, Markov blanket. That's a very astute question. Yes, I, I tried to slip past the Markov blanket because it would take another half hour to, to motivate that. But that, that's an excellent question because it, it speaks to that last slide where, where one's trying to find a, a deeper backstory in statistical physics to why this kind of self evidence behavior has to be there if any system um, manages to maintain itself in some kind of steady state. You know, you know, if it's in computational chemistry, this will be self-assembly. If it's in biology, it'd be autopoiesis. Um, if it's in um, social neurosciences, it's just basically maintaining cohesions and, and in-groups. Um, and, and, and that's where the Markov blanket comes in. So in order to talk about a system, you'd have to actually write down, well, what do you mean by 
um, a system that has some states. How are those states differentiated from the states that do not belong to the system? So that implies a set of conditional independences that, um, as you noted, um, uh, are usually a, a assigned to the blanket states, the Markov blanket. So what you say is, well, in order to differentiate a system from the rest of the universe, I will assume the existence of some states that when I condition the internal states on, they become conditionally independent of the external states, and those are the blanket states. And then you look at the, um, the density dynamics that you have under that particular partition of states into inside and outside, um, separated um, by blanket states that still permit, so the system's still open because you can, the outside can vicariously um, influence the inside and vice versa through the blanket states. But you, you then look at the, the statistical physics of that partition, and that's where the integral fluctuation theorem kicks in, which is why I was trying to, and I'm still trying to connect the optimum Bayesian design plus optimum um, Bayesian decision theory formulation in terms of um, information theory and KL divergences with the, um, the KL divergences that underwrite the integral fluctuation theorems. So that, that's, a, I think, um, I mean, it, it's a little bit indulgent, but I, you know, it, it really does, um, if you like, join the dots between the statistical physics and um, the more practical aspects of information gathering and, and exploitation. Thank you. Great, thank you, Amos. I think um, our next question is is from Bill Lawless. I know, Bill, you you put it in the chat, but go ahead and 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 uh, unmute yourself and, and just ask it. Uh, thanks for reminding me to unmute. Um, it was a really nice talk. I liked it a lot. Um, it seems to me to be uh, based on uh, on the information that's available or that could become available in. Uh, th that leads me to my question. It seems um, th that the only way that you can uncover something like deception is when it uncovers itself. Um, maybe you could uh, address that, uh, but I I'd also like uh, to find the link between, uh, which I like, Bayes and maximum entropy production. Maybe you could also address that as well if you have time. Yes, um, we don't have time to address it properly, but <laughs> we can certainly sort of uh, celebrate the existence of those those important issues and questions. Um, the, the yeah, the maximum entropy principle, um, both as it pertains in you know, in the sort of uh, classical Jamesian sense, but also as it pertains to entropy production in this sort of dynamic um, self-assembly um, formulation in terms of the integral fluctuation theorems and Markov blankets plays an incredibly important role uh, and just you know almost emerges from uh, for free from the uh, from the free energy formalism so if you if you just um, decompose the complexity you've basically got um, the entropy of your beliefs about the causes of the data and that has to be maximized um, as as mandated by things like uh, Occam's principle so that's part of this sort of um, optimal Bayesian design formulation um, and you know has its roots in in sort of Jeffrey's priors and and, J, uh, and James's interpretation of statistical physics and that so that that is really at the heart of this this um, belief based or at least conditional probability distribution or Bayesian belief based formulation of optimal behavior. Um, the, um, the, um, the 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 deception issue is fascinating because um, yeah, it speaks to um, the, the, the rather delicate and challenging and very real issue of, of applying this mechanics to dyadic or multi-agent games, where now you have the potential of the generative model, that sort of, in this instance, that Markov decision process, being a model of another model. So somebody that I am uh, in exchange with in a game theoretic or in, in a sort of uh, language sense. Um, and just, you know, the very notion of trust and deception, or indeed just the very notion of a generative model being able to explain outcomes generated by another generative model it, you know, is, is deeply challenging. Uh, and we're talking about, you know, sort of metacognition through to theory of mind here. So I think just things like deception and regret are, if you like, um, 
the you know the most challenging kinds of um, information exchange or the, the most ch challenging aspects of um, exchange direct direct exchange um, that you know, you would aspire to try and explain in terms of you know Bayesian optimality principles in this framework. I'm not sure it's been done yet. There have been baby steps in terms of putting these sort of free energy minimizing agents together. Um, what tends to happen is that they they tend to cooperate because they want to make themselves mutually predictable. So if you're trying to minimize the surprisal or the self information, um, one way of doing that is just to make sure that I am as much like you as possible um, under the prior assumption that you are doing the same. And then my, our entire uh, exchange becomes as mutually as predictable as possible. Uh, and that and that optimizes then the, the joint free energy that that, um, that we share. Did, did you have anything uh, deeper in terms of deception? Because uh, my answer was a little bit superficial in the sense that it hasn't quite been done yet. Um, um, uh, yes, I do. But you, you mentioned the word uh, assembly, which I, I find uh, to be even more intriguing. Um, one of the issues that I have with uh, von Neumann's uh, assembly uh, idea is that th there's no way to tell when the correct pieces uh, uh, from von Neumann's model, I don't know if that's what you're addressing, there's no way to know that uh, the assembly is working in the right direction, that you're actually improving the situation with assembly. Maybe you could address that. Not in a scholarly way, because I don't know um, the the, you know, the notion of assembly in the von, von Neumann uh, sense. So, so that's, I'll have to put that on the list with the firefighter problem to go and Google afterwards. Um, well, um, assembly, in, assembly in any sense. How, how do you know that you're assembling a team of, based on what you've said, uh, you want to assemble it so that the surprise is minimized? So um, one, one way of addressing that is, um, well, certainly through numerical analyses, and that's been done in, in the context of uh, dynamic interactions, but also an interesting um, dance between um, the environment and a phenotype or an assembly or ensemble of phenotypes in the context of eco-niche construction. And the bottom line is that the, because the, this variation free energy is an extensive quantity, you can read the goodness of the assembly or the ensemble um, of systems as simply the sum of each individual's free energy. So if every individual of an assemble or ensemble um, is uh, optimizing its free energy, then collectively that is also true. And then that sort of brings us back to what I was saying before, that you know, that very much means that everybody's trying to, to learn about each other so that they can render everything else or indeed the environment as predictable as possible. So we build traffic lights and roads and we have language and signs and deontic cues, or I learn your language while you learn mine. Um, uh, so that, that's a sort of the first order um, emergent property of this kind of multi-agent uh, um, assembly, if that's what you meant. Um, but I do note, of course, that that doesn't leave any room for deception. So now you have to think about uh, in groups and out groups, assemblies of this kind versus that kind, and how you might actually um, uh, use deception to exploit this sort of first order cooperative mutual predictability uh, imperative that comes out of self-evidencing with other things like me. I have a somewhat, um, maybe it's related question, but so, so as, as you were presenting, I was, I was jotting down a, a note I made to myself, and this is related to, to things that I'm interested in about the, the relationship. So, so as an economist, I'm quite interested in people's perceptions and how uh, sometimes, you know, when we observe behavior that we, we would often characterize as not rational, it actually is probably behavior that is rational, conditional on a set of, of beliefs that are possibly not correct or, or perception that's possibly not correct. Um, and so I was wondering about the distinction between perception and, and what I would call something like learned experience. And, and your slide on functional anatomy and message passing seemed to discuss that. And you seem to emphasize that beliefs are about uncertainty. And so I was wondering if there was anything that incorporates uncertainty associated with the learning side. So, so there's some uncertainty related to the outcome that results 
from repeatedly doing the same thing. So, you know, in, I think of in a rat experiment, you can design it so that there's a constancy of the experience so that after 20 times the rat knows where the food's gonna be. But, um, and, and presumably you can design a rat experiment where there's some uncertainty as to whether the food will be there. But, but I was wondering about that um, about how how experience, how you think about learned experience and and how an individual knows whether whether it's their perception or whether it's actually a series of of um, of, of experiences or or you know basically there's there's a dependence in there that I that I wasn't clear how to incorporate into into your models. Right. No. No. Excellent question. And that, and that dependence is is a really import, important part of approximate Bayesian inference that rests upon a mean field approximation or a factorization of beliefs about different kinds of things that when you actually do the belief updating um, necessarily it re, you know, repairs that dependency. So that dependence is absolutely crucial and central to any realization of this, <coughs> excuse me, this, this sort of Bayesian belief updating. And in particular, beliefs about sort of time invariant parameters of a generative model that encode laws and contingencies versus um, quickly changing states in the moment. So normally we, we talk about inference as basically belief updating about latent states of the world, uh, while learning is a slower updating of, uh, of the parameters um, of a generative model. Um, but you, you bring up so many intriguing issues. I, I just want to mention a couple of them. Bounded rationality seems to me uh, semantically and possibly rather cheekily easily absorbed into the use of an evidence bound to move from exact Bayesian inference to bounded Bayesian inference, which sounds to me exactly like um, sort of bounded rational. Um, and you could even chase up further with the complete class theorems that, as you say, for any given pair of loss functions and behaviors, there is a set of prior beliefs that render that behavior, renders that behavior Bayes optimal. So there's a lovely duality there that all rests upon the prize that define the generative model. So I, that's that, I think that's a really important point. Um, that you know we're all different because we have different priors, but we're all optimal. Uh, well, uh, at least given given those priors. Uh, practically, you also uh, brought the uh, so the the inference and learning are both in the service of minimizing this path integral of um, free energy that. Um, um, uh, uh, in an identical way, but when, when you uh, unpack the equations analytically, uh, you get the sort of fast belief updating that our neurons might do for the inference part. Uh, then you get this slow accumulation of evidence and belief updating on connectivity that underwrites the parameters. And when you start to do numerical analyses, something really simple, but I think very telling happens. But if you set off your, I'm sorry, I should say that in practice, what we generally do with discrete state space models is parameterize um, the likelihood mappings and the prior, usually transition matrices in terms of Dirichlet parameters. So you have to write down your initial Dirichlet counts. Now, if you write them down very, very small, the artifact then becomes very sensitive to evidence. So that you know, if you start off with you know two outcomes and you've got one Dirichlet parameter, after just one experience, one's going to be sort of twice the other. On the other hand, if you start off with two hundred um, Dirichlet counts and you add one more, you've got a ratio of two hundred and one to two hundred. Nothing has really changed. So your prior beliefs that, um, encode an uncertainty about your beliefs about the contingencies that you're learning. So if you come in as a sort of young artifact that's just been born with very low Dirichlet counts, you're going to be very sensitive to any evidence that is accumulated through repeated exposure. But if you're an old, wise, recalcitrant rat, you're not going to learn anything. Uh, and then it's interesting when you, coming back to the previous uh, discussion, you know, when you put two of these agents together that are trying to predict each other, if you put the old one with lots of Dirichlet counts, um, interacting with the baby one with very small Dirichlet counts, then the small one learns a lot more from the old one. So it, it's a nice metaphor for, you know, for, for teachers and parents and, and the like. Sorry, that, that's, that's quite interesting. I mean, I can imagine a situation though where there's, I mean, in, in some ways that, that, you know, young one and how it acquires experience is, is in some ways I think of as an initial condition but, but over time, you could imagine something where there's like, you know, some limited memory or memory decay so that, that in, in some steady state, there's, you know, it's, it's, it's not, 
the 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 marginal additional uh, piece of information has the same effect on on all the different agents. Now, I, I don't want to take up all the time though because I know Duncan Foley also has a question, so I'm going to hand it over to Duncan Foley as well for his question. Well, thank you um, for your presentation. I, I'm particularly intrigued by the uh, ability of uh, your ability to bring out the parallels to thermo thermodynamic concepts in this way of uh, partitioning the the uh, free energy um, relationships that are implicit in the entropy reasoning. I wanted to go though, just get your thinking on a, on a slightly different topic, which is what I would call novelty. Um, because I'm aware that in some um, models of learning, um, an important role is played by the ability of the system to create new categories or new states or uh, not just to update in the, in the typical Bayesian way, but to innovate in some way or to accommodate novelty. Um, and often there's a trade-off between the organism's willingness to view something as a novelty and start treating it as something different or trying to accommodate it within the um, framework that's already been established by experience. I, I just wondered wh how, what your thinking is on how that relates to this general perspective of Bayesian updating learning. Yep. I, I, I think it, it, it relates uh, intimately and actually provides a sort of superordinate context and it interestingly actually speaks to Robin's last question, which I would sort of frame in terms of the problem of structure learning. Uh, and when do you build an extra bit of your model to account for this new piece of data, or indeed remember that there's also this imperative to keep the model as simple as possible. So yes, you have to have that optimal forgetting, you have to have the loss of redundant connections, you have to, you have to forget stuff. So it introduces this really delicate issue. When is it optimal to believe update or indeed um, change the structure, say the new number of hierarchical levels in a deep network or add another level to some, some hidden, hidden factor? So from the point of view of um, optimizing uh, the free energy bound on model evidence, this just is Bayesian model selection. So structure learning just is Bayesian model selection under some prior beliefs about the volatility of the environment. And there will be um, an answer to your question, should I add an extra level of say hierarchical depth to my model or not in light of these data? So um, you know, if you had all the time in the world, um, then what you would do is you'd basically evaluate the marginal likelihood or the evidence bound um, with and without that extra level. And if the evidence, the marginal likelihood increased, you retain that extra level. And if it decreased, then, then, you, then you, would, you would lose uh, the extra level. Um, uh, and I frame it like that because um, there are some people who think that that's why we go to sleep, that we rehearse all the data that we've um, um, accumulated during the day and um, effectively, whilst doing things like dreaming, evaluate its capacity to explain those kinds of data and then um, identify those redundant parts of the model structure and remove those connections and simplify and do, do housekeeping of a structural sort. So again, it's speaking to this sort of optimal forgetting that, that, that Robin was alluding to. Um, and uh, I, I suspect you know, you, you, the thrust of your question, which is, which is you know, um, when do I update, when, when I don't update. Um, that would be one part. Another really important part of your question, there was a notion of novelty. Um, and um, novelty emerges in, in this scheme in a very simple way. It's simply the information gain or that intrinsic value, not about hidden states of the world, but about the parameters that we've just been talking about. So if um, in my evaluation of the expected free, um, expected free energy of a particular move, say looking over there, for example, or doing this or opening that door, there is certainly a, an information gain, an epistemic value or affordance um, relating to the resolution of uncertainty about what's behind the door. But there's also an epistemic value or intrinsic value in terms of um, what would happen if I do that generally? And that's basically scored by the KL divergence between the 
posterior beliefs encoded in by those Dirichlet parameters or the likelihood mappings or the priors before and after making, making that move. It's actually very, very simple to evaluate. Um, so that you've now got sort of two kinds of information, intrinsic um, um, value. Um, you've got the kind that um, scores the reduction of uncertainty of the information gain uh, uh, attributable to Bayesian beliefs over hidden states, and the other flavor, which we can refer to say salience, um, and the other kind um, that has mathematically exactly the same form, but it's a reduction, a relative entropy or a reduction of uncertainty uh, of beliefs about parameters that you can think of as novelty. So that hasn't been explored very much, but it becomes absolutely crucial um, when you start to um, try and explain um, sort of higher end executive functions in cognitive neuroscience, like uh, things like um, 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 sort of aha moments or insights um, that require you to go and learn um, something about the causal structure, the regularities that endure over multiple instances of a particular trial or a particular sort of sensory experience. Um, so the, 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 in my world, uh, um, in, in the active inference world, that is starting to attract a, a lot of you know, young people in terms of how they might simulate and write, and write, that, write that down. Thank you. Great. Now, I, I noticed Kenrick Nelson posted uh, something in the chat. Kenrick, do you want to um, do you want to mention it or is it is it fine that it's just in the chat? It, it's not uh, really a question. I can, just, in... I can just explain it a little bit and then if there's interest, people can follow up. But, you know, as people are asking questions about how you model deception in degrees of belief in up updating data, um, one of the things that came to mind is there's some really interesting work by Fleming Topsoy, who looks at these information theoretic models and um, games, game theory and complexity. And he uses uh, generalized entropies to model your willingness to update your beliefs. And in particular, you can parameterize it where the, the control parameter becomes a your kind of perception of risk or your perception of complexity. Um, and then you can have different players react differently to get, you know, information games where one player might you know, just accept reality and thereby you know, when they get new data, they just accept that data and update. Whereas another player uh, might be skeptical about reality and, and be less willing to change their beliefs given new data. So it's an interesting way of um, modifying these models to um, account for biases and how people accept or reject data. And I think very important if you take these ideas into um, the clinical realm in terms of psych uh, psychopathology and psychiatry, you know, the, uh, thinking about things like delusions and hallucinations or agnosias, where people have very different interpretations about what's causing their sensations and afford very different weights to the sensory evidence at hand versus their, their, their prior beliefs. So I think that's a really important perspective. Uh, just technically, I, I don't know this formulation, um, but it sounds as if you would reproduce that, um, that, that mechanics by um, hyperparameterizing the precision of various beliefs. So um, you know, if you want to make a rat more exploitative as opposed to um, uh, explorative, you can certainly increase the precision of its prior preferences um, so that it's the kind of rat that um, you know, very definitively likes these kinds of outcomes as opposed to those kinds of outcomes. And in a similar way, you can, you can parameterize the precision of likelihood mapping. So if a likelihood mapping is very imprecise, you're going to ignore a lot of data uh, because you know that the predictability of that data or its precision uh, is low. But on the other hand, if you assign your likelihood mappings 
um, undue precision, you will be enslaved and your belief updating will be very susceptible to any data and you may well start to overfit that data in relation to your prior beliefs. So I, I don't know, but that, it sounds as if that, that's, the, that, that, that's the, um, the, the set of questions about you know, the relative weighting of different sources of information and the relative weighting of sensory likelihood you know, relative to prying, priors that are being addressed. And I'll just reiterate that sounds, that sounds important because it's um, in computational psychiatry, that is usually the seat of pathology that explains a lot of false inference and belief updating um, in psychiatric conditions. Yeah, yeah. Great. So, so, so everybody, I, th I think it's time, um, especially I'm, I'm cognizant of the fact that in this virtual world, we have to keep on schedule. So I'm going to close this here, but I just want to, first of all, I want to thank Carl for an, for an excellent presentation. I want to thank everybody else for the great discussion. And, and just like in a regular, you know, sort of real world or in-person conference, I mean, Bill's already posted a, a follow-up uh, comment that, that I think, you know, hopefully I, that I find very interesting. So hopefully we can take that into the break. We can continue this discussion in the break, but I just want to close the session now so that people can take uh, 10 minutes or so and, uh, and, 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 and do whatever they can do that. But, but again, thank you so much, Carl, and, and hopefully we can continue to have uh, discussions uh, into the break. Thanks very much. Carl, if you're still there, I think, I think Bill had, a, had an interesting question and that, that it might be worth uh, having some discussion about. Right, sorry, yes, yes, I, I was just about to get a cup of coffee, so. I'm uh, sorry, no, no coffee for presenters, I'm sorry about that. Uh, yeah, this is the um, quantum biology, quantum models of biology. Wait, Bill, just, Bill, just ask your follow-up question. Yeah, it's the owl problem. The owl, uh, in your view, waits for prey to uncover itself. Um, but, uh, uh, Owls are also built in with the intelligence that uh, prey hide. And so it's got to go into the business of uncovering a deception. Um, Volkswagen had an extraordinary deception. How do we uncover uh, these deceptions ahead of time? That's the question. I see. That reminds me of the stag hunt paradigm. Have, have you, do you, this is uh, cooperation versus competition in terms of yeah, um, yeah I, I don't have an informed answer other than to uh, say that the, you know that this is this is um, sort of high-end generative modeling um, in either a game theoretic uh, or game theory sense or in um, in a social neuroscience sense uh, and the trick is to um, build the sophistication of the generative models so that they can entertain or represent the possibility that the uh, the other agent knows about the, um, the you know their intentions and that requires quite sophisticated um, quite sophisticated generative models um, and then one gets I presume into the same um, realm of um, sophistication that is found in economics you know to what extent do I um, represent your representations of me and then to what extent do I represent your representations of you representing me representing you uh, you know at, at what level of recursion uh, does you know uh, do you find that sort of um, that optimum in terms of this sort of balance between the accuracy and the complexity uh, I don't know of any of, of any uh, formal work within the sort of um, the active inference scheme but I do know that there's a chap called um, Jean Danizot um, who has um, looked at evolutionary stable strategies um, in using sort of levels of recursions of beliefs in terms of um, dyadic interactions um, and actually found something quite, quite, it wasn't quite so much the, the, um, the prey camouflaging or deceiving the predator, but it was more about um, sort of um, populations um, of two different kinds finding that evolutionally stable strategy as quantified by a, a, you know, a minimum or an optimum uh, expected free energy. And what he found was that the evolutionally stable strategy um, was half the people had to be very unsophisticated and the other half had to be very sophisticated. And that was the only stable strategy. Otherwise you, you, you got the sort of um, leapfrogging um, where you know, the deceivers try to deceive the deceivers are de de deceiving the deceivers. 
Um, but there was a sustainable strategy where there were basically sophisticated, non-sophisticated uh, agents out there. I'm not sure it was framed in terms of deception, though. I think this was more just in terms of communication. Well, thanks for your answer. Uh, sorry to have interrupted your coffee. Right. Well, I, I got so I got to do deception, firefighter problems, and what was the other thing? Oh yes, the the, the von, von Neumann assembly. Uh, these are things I have to go and do my homework on. Now. <laughs>